I think everything looks like it's working. Good gracious. Melanie Phillips is in the house. Hello, Melanie. Well, hello, Abby. I've almost forgotten what you look like. I know. It's been a while. You are the uh, the traveler, the world speaker, and I'm sh I'm very happy for everyone around the world who's been had the chance to hear everything you have to say, all your insights, and I've missed it, so it's a wonderful having you back. Well, it's not quite been all around the world, although I suppose America might think that it is the world, but I've been in America. I've been in California and Florida, and very nice it was too. So... Let's let's hear what you have to say. By the way, by the way, my parents have been traveling the world lately. I didn't get to tell you this beforehand. They were just in one of the most beautiful places, Cape Town. Oh, I've never been to South Africa. Oh my God, be they show those pictures? Cape Town, South Africa, beautiful place. Anyway, they're back home, um, and now you're here. What 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 did you hear? What did you see? What did you uh, take in from your various speaking engagements? Well, as I say, I was in California and Florida, and while I was in California, um, uh, the place was basically burning down. There was these dreadful, Literally. dreadful fires uh, that claimed we don't know how many lives. It was really dreadful. Um, but it did rather act as a kind of physical um, uh, metaphor, in a way, for um, what I found in uh, what I was finding in talking to people and yeah. in speaking, because... Um, the place is like a tinderbox um, uh, because people are, 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 are exploding in anger the whole time. You feel that there is a level of, of anger and hatred and violence just below the surface. Wow. And I only tapped into a very small amount of it, um, but it kept popping out. I was talking to a number of audiences, um, mainly Jewish, mainly Republican, but some Democrats, um, uh, but I was talking about um, anti-Semitism and nationalism. I've been writing and thinking about this a lot recently, and it's my firm belief that um, while anti-Semitism is always with us, um, it's a scourge that roars out of control when a society's in trouble. Mm. And a society's in trouble when it stops pulling together as a kind of shared project, and it starts fragmenting into warring groups. And I think that in their different ways, um, this is what's been happening in America and Britain and in Europe. The West has been fragmenting. And the whole idea of the nation, the Western nation, which is, after all, the thing that binds us together in a kind right. of common project, has been under sustained attack for several decades. And people think, I think wrongly, that nationalism uh, leads to anti-Semitism. And I think that's wrong because nationalism is simply the desire to have and identify with and, and, and defend um, a national project called a nation uh, based on a shared culture and history and traditions of the law and so on. And it doesn't follow that nationalism is bad. It's bad if it's associated with some terrible ideology, as in the Nazi period. Right. Uh, but it doesn't mean that if you are a British nationalist or an American nationalist or a French nationalist, you're a Nazi. Right. But nevertheless, among a lot of people, and particularly among the Jewish communities, I think, throughout the West, a fear. there is this belief that nationalism leads to Nazism. And so I was trying to make this point in the various talks I was giving. And apropos, I was referring, obviously, to President Trump because he has defined himself as a nationalist. And it's quite clear to me what he means by that. Indeed, he has said it in terms that what he means by that is that he, as President of the United States, will always put the interests of the United States first. He does not think that his job uh, is to promote the interests of the rest of the world um, on a kind of even level with America. Right. And in my view, uh, that is not only right and proper for him to say that as the American president, but every national leader would surely say that. Right. But unfortunately, the dominant narrative in the West is that you don't say that, 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 you know, that, that to put your country first if your country is the West is equivalent to racism and, and Nazism. And consequently, you put the rest of the world first. And I think that's in large measure why we're in such trouble in the West. And that fragmentation of our society is why we have such a terrible problem with anti-Semitism. So I was broadly making this argument to a number of different audiences. And by and large, I got an extremely sympathetic response. Indeed, in many cases, an overwhelmingly sympathetic, receptive response. But it was punctuated by a significant amount of unrest. 
among uh, uh, these Jewish audiences, not just among the Democrats among them, but among some Republicans, sort of never-Trumper Republicans. And it wasn't just a disagreement. I mean, this is what we've been finding all the time, isn't it? That it's not a question of people saying, well, I disagree with this and giving right. one a, a reasoned argument. Um, one becomes immediately uh, uh, pilloried as one, oneself a kind of Nazi supporter almost. But the level of intemperateness in these people who disagreed was remarkable. I mean, it was like a sort of, they were on a kind of short fuse. There was one woman in particular at one of the meetings I addressed who said, you know, how can you possibly say this about President Trump? He's, you know, the absolutely, you know, arch-racist, Nazi supporter, anti-Semitism enabler. And I tried to say why I thought this was wrong, and she wouldn't let me speak. And then the audience, the rest of the audience, uh, got a bit restive and said to her, let her speak. I couldn't get out the response. Eventually, I managed to get it out, and she wouldn't have it, and she went redder and redder in the face. Um, and was saying absurd things. She was repeating back to me what I was saying as if I wasn't saying it. I mean, she was saying, you know, but he said X, and I was saying, well, that's what I said he said, but you're putting a completely different interpretation on it. Can you say that specific thing, what she brought up? Yes, certainly. It was uh, it was about Charlottesville. Right. Um, she said, you know, how can you uh, say that he's not an anti-Semitism enabler, uh, or worse that effect, not a racist, when after what he said about Charlottesville? And I said, well... I think he was misrepresented about Charlottesville because um, uh, Charlottesville was a demonstration uh, against the taking down of the Confederate statues. There were people there. I don't understand the these issues. I mean, I'm British, I said to them. Um, but I understand that there are decent people for whom the taking down of the Confederate statues was, uh, was something they oppose because they think it's part of their history. Just like, you know, uh, it's wrong in Britain it's considered wrong to tear down the statues of Cecil Rhodes uh, because it's part of, of history. You don't, you, you don't just, you know, just take it down and destroy it. So there were people who felt that it was part of the Southern history. And that demonstration, however, uh, was taken over by uh, people... But it was, that demonstration was taken over by, the, on the one hand, the Antifa, on the other hand, uh, neo-Nazi types, um, uh, with ensuing violence and, and awfulness. And that's what Trump was, I thought, referring to when he said there are good people on all sides or both sides, whatever he said, something like that. And then people said, well, because he hasn't denounced in terms uh, the neo-Nazis, he has supported the neo-Nazis by saying they're, they are good people. Well, he didn't say that. That is a gross misrepresentation. So that's what I tried to say to her, and she wouldn't have it. Mm. And she said, but he said, you know, you're wrong, because he said there are good people on both sides. And I said, well, that's precisely what I've said he said. Um, anyway, afterwards, she uttered the immortal words, not in my presence, but apparently to people who spoke to her, that um, she said, I didn't feel embraced. And I thought, I just wow. don't believe that somebody can speak like this. I mean, why should, she f why should anyone think that they're entitled to feel embraced. Um, I mean, it's such a ridiculous thing to say. It's all about her feelings. Because, I mean, what she meant by that was she didn't get the better of the argument. She actually engaged in an argument. And I gave her a counter-argument with evidence. And so she couldn't win. And consequently, she didn't feel embraced. I mean, it's just pathetic, isn't it? But um, I was finding that, you know, elsewhere also, um, that there is this intemperateness of response, this inability to process information that is given and evaluate it calmly. And then, you know, you can disagree. There is ample room for interpretation of what people say, what President Trump says, ample room for different interpretations and disagreements. But it's the passion and the anger and the hatred and the on on the side of the of the people who are determined to prevent president trump from ever having uh, anything good about him said um and the inability to process calmly evidence and i was talking to um to a rabbi uh who said that in his congregation um the people were kind of first of all they were at war with each other and secondly, um, he said it's staggering to him how the people who are President Trump's 
political foes in his congregation, ascribe to him every ill in the world. Mm. You know, so in California, you know, there are these dreadful fires and it's a matter of controversy as to quite why um, it took hold in the way that it, that it, that it did, uh, the fire. But President Trump is immediately blamed for the fires. Right. You know, this guy runs amok in a Pittsburgh synagogue uh, mowing down uh, a number of Jews, killing a number of Jews. He is an out-and-out anti-Semite. He declares, I want to kill all Jews. Trump is blamed. I mean, the rabbi was saying to me, it is beyond irrational. And it's like a madness and he's in his congregation. Um, and he wasn't presiding over a democratic congregation, the Democratic Party supporting congregation. So um, I, w I was very struck by this throughout. Um, uh, and um, people just on such a, a very short fuse. We were out, I was out on a morning walk uh, with a friend and we passed a man um, uh, leading a fairly large dog. My friend nervously said to him, um, uh, is your dog friendly, sir? And he responded rather curtly, yes, it is friendly. And then as we walked on, he called after us and said, I really was very offended by your question. It's crazy. And we said, or my friend said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cause offence. What was offensive? And he said, well, the idea that I would walk my dog without... In, the idea that I would walk my dog if it wasn't safe, as if we were supposed to know it wasn't safe, it, it, that, that, that was the case. Um, and then he repeated, you know, your, your question really caused me a great deal of offence. Um, now, the man was black. I don't know whether he was reacting like that because he was black, uh, whether a white person would have said the same thing. I have no idea. I just thought, these people are on such a short fuse here. I mean, an innocent remark by somebody who's quite nervous about, about a dog produces a reaction like that. Um, it was very unsettling to be in a country where people are, are where, where there is this, this sensation all the time of such anger and potential violence just underneath the surface. Well, what does that say about a society? Because it's really a societal uh, thing right now where feelings trump everything. And it's funny using Trump, but yeah, that's basically what it is. Feelings now trump it's everything. It's all about feelings. Um, I mean, we've known this for some decades. Um, uh, you know, all, this, all the safe spaces on university campuses. It's all about the causing of offence. As if offence ever hurt anybody. Offence doesn't hurt anybody. Um, and, you know, this idea that, you know, you can't um, say anything uh, that will hurt someone's feelings. Um, and this is the this is the sort of um, the reductio ad absurdum, the most ridiculous point at which we have descended quite logically from a culture which does prioritise feelings. I mean, our culture, going back decades, basically said there is no such thing as objectivity. There's no such thing as objective truth. Right. Everything is a matter of opinion. Everything is subjective. What matters to me, what is right for me, is what is right. Nobody has the the, uh, the, the right the right to say that um, you know you shouldn't live like this because what I feel is most important to me I have to be able to to um, activate my innermost self so it's all about feelings it's all about subjectivity it's all about opinion it's all about emotion and so this is the consequence uh, we have a society run on emotion now the society run on emotion is a society which has lost not just lost short fuse it's lost its fuse completely it is in a state of perpetual emotional um, upset and uh, hysteria. And we're living through a, 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 an age of hysteria, it seems to me, in which um, uh, people increasingly are not able to respond in a rational manner to what's said to them or what's happening. Uh, they respond entirely on the basis of feelings. It's so dangerous and it's a repudiation of reason and you know we pride ourselves in the 21st century in the west as being you know the most rational society ever known to mankind um, a society which elevates science and the operation of reason and the intellect to the highest possible plane and yet what we're living through is a complete repudiation of reason which is terrifying
It's like we're in the post-rational state. Absolutely. Well, in the post, if, if, we, if we are in a post-truth state, post-truth. which is what the academy, the universities, the intelligentsia declared some decades ago, if we're post-truth, then we are post-reason, because without truth, you can't have reason. Any positive highlight from your trip? <laughs> uh, well, you know, the, the, uh, apart from that, Americans are, very, are lovely people. <laughs> Um, the positive highlight was that I, you know, for what I was saying was quite controversial, and I did get a tremendous amount of support. So that for me, that was a, that was a kind of highlight. Um, and um, uh, apart from that, it's always nice being in America. So, uh, so let me ask you this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump, uh, following the, our train of thought, and focusing on, on 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 Trump and the greater, not just America, but but. Uh, concentric circles even af- outside of that. Taking into consideration that President Trump is doing positive things, good things, but then understanding that there is just so much irrational hatred for the man and blaming him for everything, it sounds to me like he's going to be written up in the history books as one of the worst presidents of the United States, not necessarily based on fact, but based on this post-truth, post-rational era that we've now began. Well, that could be. Um, I'm wary of making any predictions at all, quite frankly. I'm, I'm, I would be unable to predict to you um, how the rest of this day is going to end. Uh, we're in such volatile times. And, you know... It depends whether President Trump uh, lasts the two years of his f- the further two years of his office, and whether he then la- whether he then survives for another four years, um, and that could make a great difference if he's in power for a total of eight years. Um, then I think that um, over that period of time, this is, our society may have changed partly as a result of his actions, uh, for the better, um, uh, and in which case he will be seen more benignly. On the other hand, he may completely screw up, um, or he may leave office uh, under a cloud, um, or worse, who knows. Uh, So one can't really predict how the world is going to look when he's left office. But I quite agree with you that if things were to remain as they are, then uh, the people who control our culture will always write him up, um, as they did before he took office, as they're doing while he's in office, and as they would, given the chance, once he's left office, that everything bad has to be ascribed to him. And um, we may be in for a period of, you know, serious social and cultural upheaval in the West, for, you know, even more than we're living through now, um, in which case, undoubtedly, he, will, he would retrospectively be blamed if things continue as they are in terms of our culture. But who knows? Who knows how our culture is going to look in a few now, years' time? You know, I'm going to take Trump out of, the, out of the equation right now. Taking Trump out of the equation, just looking at society, looking at this post-truth, post-rational thought, everything's feelings, and I'm talking from personal experience of very smart people who I know, and, and, very, and closely, close relationships, who themselves have been caught up in this totally feelings-oriented, non-rational thought. You can't talk to them anymore. You can't, there's no rational thought. And this is even before Trump came into the office. This is even with, yes, with the Obama right. years uh, with, regards to, with regards to Israel and Iran. Um, and, I, and I like to... I, I'll get to this in a second. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to this, to, to this question in a second, but just as, as an aside, the way I front the conversation of anti-Semitism today and putting into perspective... Trump years versus Obama years, Iran is the most anti-Semitic state that exists in the world today. Mm -hmm. And yet you had Obama assisting it, and here Trump trying to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal, but yet it's Trump who's looked at as the anti-Semite, and not Obama who was in a sense enabled. Meaning things are so much more complex than than, 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 than what the surface tells well, us. People don't do complexity. Um, oh, no. You know, I mean, it fries our brains when we think about it, and you know, we look at it. We're looking at it from the from, you know from the point of view of people who are professionally engaged as journalists in in looking at these things. These things are very complicated, and people. It's also human nature. People don't like to face 
horrible reality. Correct. Because if there are horrible consequences from the horrible reality, they prefer to deny the reality. Correct. And that has always been the case and always will be the case. Correct. Um, and that's certainly the case with Iran, that, you know, people think, uh, well, you know, unless we suck up to Iran, we're going to have to have war with them. Well, actually, that doesn't follow at all. Um, it doesn't follow at all. But what you have to do is to make Iran think that, you know, you will go to war with them in right. order to not go to war with them. That's the paradox. Right. And that's the terrible thing about the, the sort of soft option with Iran, that people think that, you know, by cozying up to them, you're avoiding war. Actually, they're making war and a terrible war much, much more likely. Right. That's the great paradox. But um, uh, it's, it, as I say, it's, it's human nature for people to think like that. Um, and it is astounding uh, that people can be quite so blind to it. But I mean, I, it's, I, I don't want to, uh, to return to uh, the Brexit situation because it's, first of all, too painful for me even to think about. But right. nevertheless, I have to think about it. But a similar thing is happening in Britain. Here you have a situation where Mrs May, the Prime Minister, has done a deal with the European Union which could not be worse. Um, that the, bad. It could not be worse. It's that bad. It's so bad that even people who voted Brexit think that it's better to remain in the European Union as we are now rather than have her deal because it, 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 it shafts Northern Ireland, for example. It gives the EU power over separating Northern Ireland from the United Kingdom. Um, it, uh, I mean, Mrs May has given away everything. Um, and um, the treachery involved uh, in such a deal the negation of democracy given that people wanted to leave the European Union and this deal would actually be Brexit in name only it would leave the Europe it would leave Britain tied up with the European Union in such a way uh, that it would be even worse than it is now because Britain would no longer have a seat at the table um, anyway it is the worst possible deal it is likely to unite it has united Remainers and Brexiteers in Parliament against it. It's quite likely not to be um, uh, uh, um, agreed to by the British Parliament uh, when it meets uh, uh, next month to, dis to discuss it, because it is so terrible. And yet, and yet, among the British people, there is great sympathy now for Mrs May, who is seen as being bullied by her colleagues in Parliament, who is seen as having been bullied by the European Union. She was bullied by the European Union, but it was her fault she was bullied. She basically said to them, basically, you know, here's my heart, aim at it. I mean, it was a ridiculous negotiating position. It was entirely her incompetence or worse that has led to this position. You would think in those circumstances, the people of Britain, seeing that this deal is so disastrous from the point of view of Britain's national interest, seeing that it's been arrived at by a prime minister who's negotiated incompetence, is beyond epic. You would think that they would say she's terrible, but instead they're saying, oh, she's had such a lot to put up with and look how wonderfully she has composed herself that she's continuing. Um, you know, she's not being deflected. We admire this strength of purpose. Well, strength mm. of purpose is admirable, but not if it's strength of purpose in the interest of something that's going to basically hurt your country then it becomes an obstinacy which is actually dangerous. But people can't see this. Now, why can't they see this? Because it's all about feelings. It's they look at her and they think, oh, poor woman. I mean... It's, it's also... It's, I mean, what, what you're talking about Mrs. Mary now. The, the, we've put on a pedestal the victim mentality. And if you're the victim, and who's the bigger victim, then you get put on the pedestal. What happened to standing strong? What happened to to protecting? To being no, you, if you're the victim, you get the sympathy of uh, of, of the media, it's a, it's a and the ones who stand up for themselves are the ones thrown to the wolves. It's a true. It's a victim culture. Strength is seen as dangerousness. Strength is uh, strength and power are seen as the road to all terrible things, and. Uh, the result is that we are heading for all terrible things. Right, exactly. That's the scary thing. That's the scary thing. The, the, as, the, as the West continues, and this is, I was, I, I, I was trying to phrase the question in terms of, 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 of uh, American culture today, where it's all feelings and no, and no truth and post-rational. How does that change? How does that change? How, how do we get out of that? And, but then the, 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 the strengthening of this victim culture 
the end result is that the strong ones who are the evil ones today, who are being or taking advantage of the weakening of Western culture, well, they're in, you know, they're watching from the sidelines as Western culture eats itself up, and they're going to come in and and uh, take the what, what's the, uh, the, the, the spoils. Absolutely, the uh, radical Islamists of the world understood this decades ago. They understood that the West was um, uh, ripe for the taking uh, because, especially in Britain and Europe. Um, it no longer believed in itself, it no longer believed in the nation, it no longer believed in Western culture, it was doing everything it could to undermine Western culture and undermine the nation, and it would not defend it. And they were right. They were absolutely right. And so they, you know, that's why they targeted Britain and Europe particularly, uh, but also, of course, they targeted America. Right. Um, and in America, at least there are some people who are fighting for their nation. So they had a tougher, they were got a tougher fight in America. Right. Um, but they understood that at the core of the West is a profound cultural demoralization, which makes it ripe for the taking. All right. All right. Well, I want to end on a positive note, and I'll, but I'm going to tie it in. I'm going to tie it into this whole thing because Israel, in a sense, is in it's in a very um, it's in a conundrum, let's say. Because on the one hand, we're fighting for that victim status, right? Oh, Gaza, they're, Gaza, Hamas, they're shooting at us, they're shooting at us, we have to protect us. On the other hand, we are protecting ourselves to a certain degree, and we are going to survive because we do stand up and protect ourselves. And therefore, we're in a sort of place of, of, uh, of being an example to the world, <laughs> even though the world does not want to look at us as being an example. <laughs> say it doesn't. Uh, but again, I'm looking at it from the positive angle right now, and us on our own, as our own culture, trying to survive while we're we're apart, but not apart of this sinking of this Western uh, culture. Well, indeed, I mean, I've often thought and I've said uh, that Israel is going to be the last man standing um, in terms of uh, the West, and I use the word West in that this respect in kind of inverted commas because. The idea that Israel is a Western nation Correct. is really a little bit bizarre Correct. because it's in most respects an Eastern nation. But anyway, a Middle Eastern nation. But um, uh, uh, insofar as it's a, considered to be part of you know, Western culture, um, it is going to be the last man standing because it's, it's insanely optimistic. I mean, a country which, like Israel, is reproducing itself with people having, what, three or four children on average... Um, uh, is, a, is, a, is a country which has hope in the future for itself. It's an act of confidence in itself, whereas in Europe, Britain and Europe, it's not, they're not reproducing themselves, and that's because they don't actually have any faith in themselves, and they don't have any faith in their having a future. Right. And Israel is defending itself because it has to, because the Jewish people have understood that you know, unless they defend themselves, uh, nobody else will. And that's a bitter and painful lesson that we've learned through our history. But Israel is able to defend itself because it has, a, and I've written about this with the Jerusalem Post in this last few days, um, it has a very strong sense of itself as a nation. I mean, the Jewish people, this is what people in the West really don't get. The Jewish, Jewish people is not just a set of people bound by a religion. Jewish people is a people, it is a nation. Right. And um, it's ancient, the ancient kingdom uh, in Israel uh, was in fact the first nation and the paradigm nation and you know this is the thing about Israel it pulls together I mean for goodness sake Israel is one of the most divided countries in the world you could say because you know Jews are incapable of agreeing about anything and so Israel is a country where everyone's always tearing each other apart but when it comes to it everyone pulls together to defend the country. Right. Um, it is like one big family a family you know fights among itself but you know, when push comes to shove, it is a family Correct. bound together. Correct. Um, and this is the this is the priceless gift of being a nation, of being feeling you're a nation. And that's the thing that the West doesn't have. It doesn't have this feeling anymore of what a nation is. It doesn't have this feeling of a common project mm. that it supports, that it endorses, that it feels that it feels morally right, and that it will defend. And consequently that's why Israel is the nation which is defending itself. And the West um, is now a group of societies um, called nations, which, are, which have, have basically um, emasculated or eviscerated themselves as nations um, and no longer can defend themselves. Um, and I think that's also one reason why they 
the West has such a difficulty with Israel, it can't deal with the fact that a nation defends itself where necessary by force. Leave aside the fact that if you look at what's going on in what's been going on in Gaza, Israel goes to the most in ridiculous lengths right. to avoid force, to avoid war. Right. But nevertheless, when push comes to shove, it does go to war. And the West cannot accept this. They cannot accept that a nation, a Western nation, is entitled to use force to defend itself. It believes that instead you have to force, you have, you, you have instead of using force, you have to sit around the table and negotiate and have compromise and have peace processes. And as a result, the West is going down. Um, and they can't see it. And so when they look at Israel, a little nation defending itself, um, they think this is, this is wrong and this is bad and this is evil. It's a nation, it's a Western nation, so-called. It's a Western ethnic nation, absolute crime of crimes. And it's a Western ethnic nation that's defending itself where necessary by force. Totally, you know, it's, it's quadruply damned. Right. But Israel is going to be the last man standing. Wow. Oh my God, fabulous insight as always from Melanie. Melanie, it is a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure, Abby. And um, anyone, if you have not yet signed up for Melanie's newsletter, get it straight to your inbox when she has the time to write, when she's not speaking or planning or writing her speeches. So go to melaniephillips.com, sign up for her newsletter, and it should be a good, safe week, Melanie. It should be a good, safe week for all of us. And thank you, everybody out there, for watching and listening. Take care, everyone. Thanks for watching.